Hi, and welcome to Mission Control, where we have Scott Smith, a doctor that's uh, with us to talk about uh, the effect of microgravity on uh, humans when they're in space, and uh, not only how it affects them while they're in space, but also how it affects them when they come back home to Earth. Welcome in, Scott. Thank you. It's good to be here. So you are the uh, principal investigator for a couple of different experiments on board the space station, uh, one that's called Pro-K, another one that's called uh, Nutrition, uh, and you recently published a paper about uh, vision changes in astronauts in space. Uh, can you take a minute and discuss the two experiments that you're the principal investigator on and any others you're working on, for that matter, uh, and uh, and give us a, an overview of those? Okay, we will do. Well, the, the two experiments, as you mentioned, one of them is called Pro-K, and that's one where we're looking to use diet as a way to mitigate the bone changes that we see during space flight, or trying to modify the diet to lessen the bone loss that astronauts have during flight. And what we do is we're, it's called Pro-K because what we're looking at is the ratio of animal protein to potassium, which is abbreviated K, uh, in the diet. And what we believe is that by lowering the amount of animal protein, or red meat, if you will, in the diet, or increasing the amount of potassium in your diet, mainly in fruits and vegetables, that that ratio can affect bone. So what we're doing is we have crews consume a controlled diet for four days where they eat a menu that's either high in that animal protein to potassium ratio or low. And at the end of that, we collect blood and urine to look at, at bone metabolism. And this is an exciting week for us because Joe Acab is doing his first session uh, for us. So he's consuming that menu these, these, uh, these days right now. Um, and on Friday morning, we'll collect his first blood and urine samples uh, on board station. That's great. So that's the Pro-K. What about nutrition? The nutrition experiment uh, has been going on a little bit longer, and it, it in some ways looks the same, And that what we're doing is collecting blood and urine samples from the crew uh, over the course of a six-month mission to look at nutritional changes and, and other biochemical changes that we can see in blood and urine. And one of the striking things, and you mentioned the paper that we just recently published, is when we realized that there were astronauts that were coming back from space with vision changes, we started to look at our data to see if there was anything in our data that would help explain or help understand why some crew members had vision issues and some crew members did not, okay? And when we started looking at the data, what we quickly found was what we would call differences between folks that had vision changes and folks that did not in, in parameters in what we call the one carbon metabolism pathway which is a mouthful. What this is, and the way I like to think of this is, if you think of the human body as a factory, that within the body there are a number of assembly lines that do different things. They either make things, they move things, uh, sometimes they break down things. Okay, the one carbon metabolism pathway is one of those assembly lines, okay? And on an assembly line, the, the way I like to think about this is that if you're working on an assembly line and you, and you have two conveyor belts bringing you parts, and your job is to put those two parts together, if one of those conveyor belts slows down, the other conveyor belt will start to back up. That is, you'll have extra of those parts, okay? And that is what happens in the body, that if, if one pathway slows down, some of the things in that pathway will build up. And what we found uh, when we started looking at the blood of astronauts that had vision issues is we found elevations in four of the compounds in this specific pathway. And what that led us to believe is that, uh, well, first, it led us to think that there was something going on with the one carbon metabolism pathway, okay? The next thing you do, the reason we were looking at this pathway to begin with is that it's very nutrition rich. There's at least four vitamins that are involved in this pathway, uh, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, folate, biotin. And the first thing you need to do is rule out deficiency of those vitamins because if you're deficient in folate, for example, um, these pathways will be altered as well. So that was our first concern. And we went in, long story short, we verified that we did not have, we did not have any crew members who were deficient in any of those vitamins, okay? So what we then started doing was looking at this pathway and trying to understand it better ourselves. And we came to the realization that what happens oftentimes is that there are enzymes there are enzymes in these pathways that help to work, okay? So the enzyme in this case is the person putting those two things together on the assembly line, okay? And what we realized is that there are differences in different groups of the population in these enzymes, okay? And the differences exist uh, in large percentages of the population. So for instance, one specific enzyme we looked at 
about half the population has one form, about a, a third has another form, and about 15, 20% has the third form. And when you're talking about the population, you're talking about the entire human the race. The entire human population, that's right. And so what we're talking about is, is 15, roughly 15 out of every 100 humans has this particular enzyme that causes this pathway to work slower. And so, so we're not talking about random occurrences or one in a million type things. This is a lot of people. When, when we started to look again, when we found these differences in the astronauts, in the astronauts that had vision issues, specifically what we found is that not only were there differences between those that had vision issues and those that did not, we found those differences before flight. So we realized this likely had nothing to do with spaceflight itself, but that this may have been related to something that was, was different about those individuals before they even flew. So this was obviously um, a very exciting find. Uh, and what we're now trying to do is we're going back and doing a follow-on study that will allow us to go in and look at those specific enzymes to see which type of enzyme these individuals have to see if this is right. Because that is, we, you know, there is the possibility that this is still a fluke, that we found a difference, but that it has nothing to do with the actual vision changes. So we're, we've, we wrote a proposal, we got approved to go do this follow-on study, and earlier this month we actually started uh, recruiting subjects to participate in that, where we're actually going back to the astronauts, talking to them about the experiment, and asking them, asking them if they'd be willing to allow us to collect blood to go in and look again at the exact specific enzymes. So we're, it's, a, it's a very exciting point in time. And so if your hypothesis ends up being correct as you do your follow-on studies, uh, there's some important ramifications for long-duration spaceflight, aren't there? Well, I would say two things. One, again, if our hypothesis is right, um, there could be some significant implications for long-duration spaceflight. Um, and, you know, NASA, when we realized that there were vision changes in astronauts, that is, it's, it's been described as the most significant clinical issue of human spaceflight to date. Okay, so this is something that we need to fix before we go further. And there's a lot of folks out working hard trying to better understand this, trying to figure out ways to counteract it and protect against it. Um, if we're right, we will, we will help drive that pathway to better understand how to counteract it, to better understand what the issues are. If we're right, beyond NASA, um, this pathway affects, again, 15, 20 out of every 100 people. Um, and the, the implications for treatment of disease on Earth or understanding of disease on Earth um, could be significant. Great. Well, that, that, so that's a, a really potentially big benefit to the human population uh, based on research that's done on astronauts on orbit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, can you tell us a little bit about how microgravity itself makes your experiment possible? What, how does that change the, the game? Well, it depends on the on on what you're looking at. For the, going back to the Pro-K experiment, where we're looking at bone, um, what spaceflight allows us to do from a bone perspective is to study very healthy individuals in a very unique environment. That is weightlessness. And what happens is the astronauts lose bone at about 10 times the rate of a woman with osteoporosis. So. What it allows us to do is narrow in and study people that, that typically don't have other health issues, and in a much shorter amount of time allows us to study how to counteract the, the bone loss that we see in spaceflight, which again, the, po the potential implications of that for the general population are significant. And we can do studies that, and learn things in a matter of months that would take five, six, 10 years to do in a, in a similar ground-based population. Okay. It takes a, a while for those kinds of things to be manifested in normal medical treatments here on Earth, right? Absolutely. And, and it, it, changes in human physiology tend to be rather slow, which is a good thing for, for us. Um, but understanding them and, and the research that it, that it takes to better understand a, a disease process or a physiological change, uh, to better understand the process and figure out ways to counteract it, um, is indeed a, is a, is a, slow, is a slow process. Where do you work here at the Johnson Space Center? I work in what's called the Nutritional Biochemistry Lab within the Space Life Sciences Directorate here in, in Houston. And is that the traditional kind of laboratory that you'd expect to see in anybody that's studying nutrition? Um, in, in a sense, yes. It is, it's very similar to a, a nutritional biochemistry lab that you'd find at any university. The difference is that we, um, by the nature of what we do, um, we cover a much broader area. 
That is, we're looking at not only nutritional assessment, we're looking at dietary intake, we're looking at vitamin status, we're looking at minerals, we're looking at bone. We cover the gamut. Uh, whereas if you were to go to a university and go to, into one lab, you'll find somebody working on one enzyme in one pathway with one vitamin, and they'll spend their career trying to understand that. Um, what we do to counteract that, because again, we, we try to cover as much ground as we can, we typically will bring in individuals from the outside. So we always work, we always work with scientists at universities across the nation, around the world, um, to help us understand specific areas that we may not have uh, the direct expertise in. Okay. And uh, since you mentioned universities, uh, what's your background? Where are you from? Where did you go to school? I, uh, I did both my degrees at Penn State. Uh, my, my undergraduate degree was in biology, and my PhD was in nutrition. What's your hometown? Uh, right now it's Houston. I've spent more time here than anywhere. So okay. <laughs> I, I grew up outside of Philadelphia uh, and spent a lot of time in Pennsylvania, but I've been here for a little over 20 years now, so it's home. Okay, great. Well, Dr. Scott Smith, thank you so much for being with us today. Really interesting work that you're doing right now, and it's got some potential uh, impact for future of human space flight and for just everyday folks here on the ground uh, with, with, uh, with their bodies and, and uh, treating disease. Absolutely. And I thank you for the opportunity. It was great to be here. Great. Thanks again. Thank you.